Welcome everybody to today's webinar. My name is Phil Andrianos. I'm the Digital Marketing Specialist here at Cybra. We're going to get started in just a moment. Uh, before we do, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, please keep in mind you will be muted throughout this webinar, but that doesn't mean you can't interact with us. This, this is an informational webinar, so we hope you have lots of questions. On the, on the go to webinar console to your right, you can chat with us and ask us any questions you may have. We'll do our best to answer your questions as they come up throughout the presentation. Uh, we may hold your questions for the end of the webinar, and uh, if we can't get to them, we'll be sure to follow up with you after. Uh, this presentation will be recorded, and we'll be sending you the link to it so you can watch again if you'd like, and of course, uh, share with your colleagues. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to present our uh, introduce our presenters. Today we have uh, Sheldon Reich, uh, Chief Solution Architect for Cyber Corporation, and Mike Shabet, VP of Sales and Marketing at Cybra. Uh, Mike and uh, Sheldon have spent decades in the supply chain learning the value of an integrated approach to mining RFID data for added value. Altogether, Mike and Sheldon have over 50 years of experience in this industry. Uh, I'm excited to get this webinar started. Mike, uh, Sheldon, if you guys are ready, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, we are ready. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. I'm ready to go. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, hi, this is Sheldon. And thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, we, we had a tremendous turnout. We're really uh, very uh, pleased with the turnout. And it's nice to see uh, many of our customers as well as our partners who are on the line. And hopefully we'll, you know, we'll have a productive uh, session and you guys will come back with some, uh, some meaningful data. Um, Mike Shabet and I have what we call a lot of scar tissue. And uh, those of you in the industry know what, what that means. I've seen Michael go for a ride on a conveyor and other material handling equipment. And um, uh, I'm sure he's got some good war stories to, to, to share with us as we, as we go on. So I'm going to uh, move on to the next screen. And uh, you recognize Good friend, the Terminator. Uh, that's a, perhaps what, uh, what we think about when we think of artificial intelligence, but actually I think it could be a force for good. Um, we have a, a, a range of both technical and non-technical people on the, uh, in the audience. So the, the, this presentation won't be too technical. So I have to give a little bit, some introductory concepts so that to, to just to help uh, the business people along, and uh, that we will get into some technical things. Uh, we'll talk about how how machines learn, what the difference is between artificial intelligence and machine learning. Where does RFID fit in this discussion? And that's obviously why everybody's on the line. So we'll get into that. We've got some retail use cases about how this approach can help you solve some really vexing problems in the retail uh, supply chain as well as an industrial uh, use case or two that this, that, uh, for uh, the products that don't fall into the traditional uh, retail paradigm. And of course, we'll be open for some questions. So let's get started. Um, we'll make the Terminator uh, terminate him. This is a great example of artificial intelligence. You gotta admit, it's very cool. It's the Google Translate app. And basically, you point your phone at a sign or in this case at a menu, and it translates it on the fly, just like a human being would, just like you know, art actual intelligence. A person who can speak a second language is able to look at a menu or a sign, and he translates it in his, in his head. The, uh, uh, those of us that don't speak foreign languages, uh, it's this way you use the app, you select which uh, language it's going to translate to, and it uh, does that pattern recognition and really, uh, you know, converts on the fly. It's super powerful. So, in a broad sense, artificial intelligence is machine carrying out tasks in a way that we consider smart. It's uh, an oddball way of looking at it, but it's true. This is a smart thing to do, to, to um, take a picture of a sign or a menu and translate it on the fly. It's, it's, literally a, something that we take for granted with our brains, but it's very similar to natural intelligence as artificial intelligence. The key in 
that machine learning is narrower. It basically this concept that we should be able to hand to the to a, to the computer, to the system of computers, to a network of computers, a batch of data, and the machines will learn by themselves to help us solve a problem. So you've got something that's um, a broad concept would be the artificial intelligence where it's almost wired like our brain. And uh, in the machine learning sense, which is a narrow, uh, uh, a narrower sense where we're taking a bucket of data, we ask the machine to look at it, make something meaningful out of it, and give us some insight. So in a sense, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. It's a small, because here's I'll go uh, another way, which is, you're familiar with our friend Alexa. Alexa has something called NLP, nat nat natural language processing. It's a user interface for Alexa and Siri and Cortana. And why? In, in that it, it, it communicates you know, with the English or language or Chinese or Greek, whatever language you're talking to it. And um, it has this concept of, of sentences, literally, and commands, and, and this whole, you can converse with it with, with, to a degree, and that is your user interface for dealing with it. Now, in our case, you don't necessarily need to have natural language processing to be able to communicate with your RFID data. Although, in theory, you certainly could by building a, an Alexa uh, skill set or et cetera, and you have uh, particular queries that you could ask Siri or Alexa to run, but it's not the same. The actual foundation under which Alexa, Siri, and company operate is, um, is a natural language processing, and that is built into their uh, d design, which is how to, um, it's almost like you know, the branching logic and, and, and the, the, they try to mimic the way a human would understand language. But it's not such a case. But one of the things that's really important is that Alexa and her friends and machine learning in general, it needs big data. Uh, you know, in other words, the cloud, you, you, we didn't have Alexa until you had the cloud. And meaning that it, it's really an astonishing amount of data. The larger the sample sets, the better the stuff gets. And that's a very important uh, point about machine learning. And that if you give it one or two examples, it can't make any, can't learn anything. And it learns the more you feed it um, uh, uh, data. And that's why the cloud is so critical in a um, in, in machine learning, and while plenty of the tools that are former machine learning, you can find them in the cloud. Okay, so how do machines learn? This is a big question, and it starts off basically recognizing patterns. Now, there's many other uh, types of processing that's going on, but in its most simple sense, mach machines learn by recognizing patterns. For example, objects in real scenes. And in our case, that's very close to what we're trying to, to determine is an, you know, uh, a product in a supply chain. Or, 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 or we're trying to identify patterns. You know, facial identity, of course, which is, you know, think about how challenging that is, uh, doing that out of a moving video. That's a tremendous pattern recognition, pattern matching at very high speed. And of course, with Alexa and Siri and company, uh, the able to uh, recognize a pattern of spoken word. So here's a simple pattern. On the one on the left, find the O in a sea of Qs, and on the right, find the Q in the sea of Os. And you can ask this of a blob of data. You feed this blob of data, and you tell the um, the uh, They ask the system to, 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 to study this to determine what, what, what the pattern is. And here's a joke, a cartoon, where, sweetheart, I fear something did not work right with how we applied 
the law of attraction, or he has a problem with pattern recognition, as the, the stripes obviously interfere with the pattern that's in the room. So Google fed thousands of pictures tagged cat into the Google Photos app machine learning initial data set to teach the software how to identify a cat by, by, by pattern matching. So they, they fed the, um, you, know, you know, X number, very large number of pictures of cats so that when you take a picture of a cat with your phone and that goes up into the Google Photos app, they automatically can characterize the picture of, the, of this kitten as a cat, as a baby cat or whatever. And this is it in, a, in, a, in a basic nutshell. So they train the software, they set it a very large uh, data set, and then they pattern match to see, okay, these are cats, that must be a cat. Another way machines learn is by discovering anomalies. So that's like this pattern matching and anomaly. So the, the uh, an unusual pattern is then, okay, what doesn't meet the, the pattern um, is an anomaly. So for example, an unusual pattern of a sensor reading. So everything's going along fine, and then boom, you get spikes at a certain time. Something's different. The machines learn by n noticing that there's a difference in the sensor reading. And this is a really key point. So it's either I see a lot of the things that, uh, uh, you know, recognizing the pattern and then recognizing the anomalies and being to identify them. So to review here, to solve a problem with machine learning, the machine learning algorithm must have a pattern. So something's got to be, you know, predictable and there's that pat must have a pattern to, to, to glean, to infer from. And then you've got to give it enough of sample examples to apply machine learning to a problem. I apologize here for this that's going on. Um, so it, it, it was, we're in the third stage of computing. The first stage of computing was called tabulation. Uh, punch cards, uh, the Hollerith tabulating machine, if you recall, the beginning uh, for IBM's first machine, which was just um, uh, like punch cards, but literally it could count and it would summarize. Then we went into the, the era that we're in now, which is the transactional era of processing. And that is, is that you can break problems down into their um, individual program steps, such as divide, uh, um, average, uh, sum, all the functions that we do, let's say, in Excel. But obviously, for programmers who are working on application systems or even in a sub program like PageMaker or, um, or a GIS system, do, you can break that down into the small, uh, to these very small chunks and be able to apply a uh, series of instructions to, to achieve the, the result. The third step, which is where what we're talking about here is called cognitive uh, computing. And that is, is that if you can't formulate a mathematical expression to describe the behavior of the problem, you want the computer to look at the pattern to examine the data and come out and infer the and learn and figure out the uh, insight all by itself. That's that, that because it's it's it, it, yes you could do it, but it would take you so many 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 man hours that it would be very uh, impractical. So machine learning is derives meaning from the data. This. You find patterns, finds an am uh, uh, anomalies, and then it performs structured learning. Structured learning meaning that it, it does go through loops and it tests 
and is it a you know looking at those pictures for example in the google app it goes is it a bridge is it a dog is it a cat oh it's a cat you know and turn around again it looks like the cat example that we have uh, and that, but you could do this with, with anything again too big of a job for a, a human programmer to break it out and try to do a one instruction at a time but these systems using the cloud using the processing of the cloud uh, are able to um, to infer this uh, uh, meaning um, from this data and these patterns, and it goes through the structured learning process. To continuing how they learn, it's an iterative process, and that's a key point. Is that if you uh, you know you want to get into this and you want to, to use this, it's iterative, and that means you first you add the data. So that means you're going to feed these tremendous data sets to the machine learning system. You, it, it's not a human hands off of, 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 at all. You know, not, not, I don't want you to, to anybody to think that. It does require um, the cleaning and, and prepping of the data. And specifically, uh, for example, with those photos of cats, if there was a cat and a dog in the picture, you probably want to snip away the dog so that the uh, it's a very clean pattern for the, um, you know, a clean picture of a cat for the for that test for that sample to be able to process. But it, remember, it doesn't have to be cats; it could be bolt, you know, a, a, a bolt, a hex, a hex bolt, uh, whatever, a, 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 an eight millimeter bolt is a certain kind of bolt, and then you could be able to to, to um, create a sample of perfect pictures of eight millimeter bolts, and then the anomaly would be one that's chipped. So if you were doing a machine vision inspection, it would catch the bad one um, because it's pattern matching against the samples of what good ones are. Or, go another way, you could take a picture of all your bolts that you cut out of your toolbox spread out on the floor, and it could total them up, and just by pattern matching all the way around, it would be able to give you an inventory of the bolts that are that are in your box. But the idea being that you, the humans are required to clean and prepare the, the, this data, and to train the model, to, to, to train it for the pattern that we're looking to identify. Okay, and give a, a good example of this is if you. If, uh, if you recall, um, IBM Watson won a Jeopardy, the TV show, and think about how they had to train Watson for Jeopardy. So there was two parts of it. There was training it how to, you know, with the all the material that could possibly be an answer, and then the harder part actually was training it with natural language processing to understand how um, Jeopardy asks questions or gives answers and you have and then the machine would have to pose the questions that gave the you know with that answer but that was that was actually a very difficult for Watson to do but in terms of training it training the model uh, to begin with they had to load the entire encyclopedia they had to unload uh, let's say you know bullboards of um, song titles for the past 50 years or the uh, Academy Award uh, winning film, films for every category, etc. So because as if you think of the breadth of the categories that Jeopardy asks questions about, all of that data had to be fed into the system so that it would be able to uh, you know, have the answer at hand as well as understand the clue and then make the question. And then you test it. Uh, so just like I like explained with the cats, uh, you, you or present with a, something that is, you know, unknown even, and ask the system, well, well, well what is this? And if it comes back and, and gives you a crazy, you know, result, then, then you've got to train the model a little better. Um, and if it's close, then you can find, and it's fine tune, or you continue and let it process further and improve it. So the idea is this iterative process, and it's rinse and repeat. We'll rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, and, and after the five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten or iterations, whatever it takes, then the system starts to learn by itself because it's got so much test data in there, 
it's got refined models, and um, it can make decisions based on the patterns and the anomalies, the anomalies that it sees. If you have any questions, please pass them along. Uh, we will have time for, for some more. So that's the basic overview of machine learning and the subset of artificial intelligence. So let's talk about next. Where does RFID fit in? Well, let's think about you know the miracle of our brains. My God, we instantly process sight, which includes color, light, we uh, we can and reading and all the other things that we do with our sight. Uh, we instantly process sound, uh, touch, taste, smell. Pretty incredible, right? So how does this apply in your world? Well, the human brain takes all that data and makes sense of it. We somehow process it. There's the, the neurons and the synapses and the loops in the brain, etc. There we go. Okay. So with in your business, you've got video, you've got loss prevention video, you have the weather, humidity, temperature, you're you're responsible for it, right? You may not think about it all the time, but you certainly do if you've got a thermostat in your factory store facility of some kind. So you're doing climate control for either the people who are in your facility, your staff. Or perhaps you're doing climate control for your production process. Um, there's light. There's quality of light. In a printing plant, you better have really good light because you could be printing the wrong colors and not even know it. Color is important. Kilowatt hours of electricity use. You're, you're using up. You're getting an electric bill. You could be monitoring that. Um, if your products are tagged with RFID, Yet another element of your of your business, uh, uh, GPS perhaps, uh, location coordinates, longitude, latitude. All of this is the data and the sensors that are the inputs of your the, the the organism that is your business. And then Internet of Things, another term that we've been you know buzzword, but the machine learning takes all this data and can make sense out of it. And it makes sense out of it to solve a problem because it makes sense out of it by seeing a pattern or seeing an anomaly. Because, and, and let's, let's talk about some examples. So, well, before we even talk about the examples, what ties it all together? How, what's the one thing that every one of those data points shares? It's a time and a date stamp. At any point in time in your facility, a Monday at 3.20 p.m., March 23rd, et cetera, what's going on at that point? You have a temperature reading. You've got an item at a certain point, whether with RFID tag, for example. You've got a light reading. You've got, if in a factory, you've got um, uh, an RPM turning on a on a motor, there's something's going on because it's just an it's a nonstop organism, but you can take a slice of time. You can grab it at any time, and all of these sensors data can be taken from uh, look through the the lens, for lack of a better term, and you can grab an individual point in time and get what all those readings were. Can that be useful, etc. That's to be determined, but that that's where that's the, the glue. That's the, where where it, where it ties it together. The time and the date stamp for each of those sensor readings. So, let's talk about a typical RFID use case. One that a number of you, I know for sure, are doing right now, and that is is that the GS1 EPC Electronic Product Code uh, standard for a 96 bit. Serialized global trade item number RFID tag. Okay, the, um, you've got your filter value showing you the shipping unit. You have the company prefix, the name of the company, the item reference, and then a unique serial number for that. Yeah, that's great. Okay, it allows us to do all sorts of tricks. But 
what do we do with that information? So when you read the tab, say, yeah, all right, maybe you get the uh, location, quantity, no, you know, whether it's sold or not, depending if it was read at point of sale. What else are you doing with it? There's that typical case. Basically, the only thing you're going to you're sharing with your warehouse management order processing system, typically the item and the quantity. Okay, that's that's what that's what you're sending up. Okay, you're not using the rest of the information, or you you may not be using. I shouldn't say that. Okay, and um, okay, so let's talk about the, a new use case, uh, talking about some of the concepts that I brought up. All right, so this is a what is hot selling blazer, it's a nice little mohair item. And um, I don't know, it's taken into the dressing room a lot. It's not being sold. And it shows up on your report as, I don't know, this used to be a great selling item. And now, goes into the dressing room, but it doesn't, it's not sold. It's always we, when we go in and, and look and see what's in the dressing room at the end of the day, these things are piled up in there. Why? How do you figure out why a perfectly valid item that's been a, a, a winner is all of a sudden not moving? Okay, well, let's look at the census. Is there a pattern across the store? Is this happening in all the stores, or is it just happening in one store? Is this item not sold in all the stores? What's the pattern? What's the pattern that the machine's going to pick up? Let's look at the sensor data. Okay, what 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 can it tell us? Okay, so the first thing, you, the first one you can answer, you, your first pattern that you get, that you'll get an answer of is that, is this behavior consistent in all the stores? It's not consistent in the stores, so it's in that one store. What's going on in that one store? Let's look at the sensor data. So according to the retail designer, the, the um, architect and the uh, uh, merchandising team, the, the, te the light temperature, the color temperature of the light in your dressing room should be between 5,500 and 6,000 degrees Kelvin at the measure of color temperature. Okay, that is a it's a perfect nice white light shows all the colors of the clothing you know in the brightest it's beautiful it's uh, same way like a diamond dealer would have a very high Kelvin light uh, so that when you're looking at those stones they sparkle the best they can. Same thing. So in, in retail and also in a lot of commercial, the white is supposed to be light. And in this case, the reading should be between 5,500 and 6,000 K. But is there an anomaly? Checking that, again, you're not, the machine will tell you this, but is there an anomaly? For example, this is what happens if your light or if one bulb or if a bulb in one dressing room is failing or going soft or has a problem or whatever the reason is, but your sensors are not reporting a 5,000K uh, color, it's reporting a 27, you know, whatever, 3,000K color. Well, that could mean when somebody looks at that beautiful um, blazer in that dressing room, they go, ugh, it looks like oatmeal or some other, it doesn't look like the color that you want, that you're expecting them to see it at because it turns out there's a failure in your light and the lighting and that would be caught by the sensor. You wouldn't have figured it out. It would take forever to figure it out. Or what if the color temperature is okay in all the stores, but the item is not selling? Well, let's look and see when this started. Hmm, it started around this particular date. We go and we look at the actual EPCs from when they all of a sudden stopped selling. And sure enough, it's a new lot that's coming in from a factory, and your supplier changed the material, did a substitution by accident, on purpose, doesn't, you know, that's to be determined. But the point is, you have some place to look and to start. 
and you did it because you had these other supporting data from the light sensor in this case telling you that um, you know that a either one store the lights were failing and that's why it wasn't selling in the one store or no the lights were fine in all the stores some it, it's something else and uh, you, you check the RFID based on the when it you know when, uh, um, when it stopped based on the that your, your, your data based on when um, the reads that were taken in the dressing room showed a lot of uh, you know not, not not a lot of cell through and you can tie it into that EPC code for that for those, one of those items and then you check the item against the receipt and then you notice it's a different lot and then you can you know actually examine the goods and make that the determination. Key point here is RFID data. If you right, can pinpoint the change in quality, either the environmental quality or the actual quality of the of uh, of the item itself, in when looked at in context with other sensor readings. Here's another example. So we've got a. Um, the planogram calls for only one brand's items in this pie. This, this is the area for XYZ brand, and XYZ brand only the skirts, the jackets, the handbags from XYZ Corporation and the shoes should be in this particular area. Okay? All right, and then every day, RFID, uh, it's cycle counted. Uh, uh, associate walks around with the handheld, Takes all the readings and, and, and uh, does the cycle counting to make you know make sure your inventory is at the right level. Okay. But machine learning is telling you, you know what? I can see that there's the RFID data doesn't match the planogram. There are some tags here from ABC Corp that don't belong in the XYZ pod. Okay, so it could generate a report. Or you can get a frame grab of the video of the display, and it can be augmented with the anomalies. Show on this picture, this frame grab, at this point in time, when that cycle count was done, where the things that were on the planogram that don't belong. Just a tool, just helps it faster. Okay? Now, um, There's many examples like this. Michael, uh, why don't you give us some examples of how RFID gives you capabilities that you don't have with your traditional processes? Thank you, Shelley. Yeah, when you were talking about, about the uh, the EPC and you shared with us the structure of the EPC showing item and the serial number and filter values and so forth, what most EDI systems do is they strip off the serial numbers, they concatenate the UPC and give you a quantity. So as you saw, the only data that you have left is item and quantity. Now, if you're sourcing from multiple factories or multiple locations, and you need to ship to, let's say some uh, international shipments, Canada, Europe, Asia, and so forth, the federal government requires export documents to be generated. And those export documents require country of origin information. So if you're bringing all this material in, you know by the serial number, the source of that particular product, whether it be a garment, electronic component, whatever it might be. So you can source that, you, you know the source of that. So by retaining that serialized data, and matching that up with everything else associated to it in its supply chain, you now have visibility to a lot of data uh, associated to that item other than just an item number and, 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 and a quantity. Now, typically when you're shipping something out, uh, because you're only working with UPC, you've lost a lot of visibility, 
uh, someone needs to manually handle that product, that garment, that sneaker, uh, that lamp, whatever it might be, uh, and needs to look at it to find the country of origin and log that information for that shipment somewhere, whether it be yo yellow pad and pencil, whether it be a spreadsheet on a computer screen, whatever it might be, it's a laborious process. Now, if we retain that information in our central repository. We retain that with all of its attributes. So we have visibility to all of the attributes of that item. So now all I need to do is to package an item for shipment. And as part of the outbound validation, all I have to do is flash that carton with RF. I now know everything that's in that carton. I now have visibility to the COO documents, country of origin export documents. And I know my counts and my blends are correct. Uh, the other example you talk about where uh, the store, uh, you know, we had an anomaly where all of a sudden this particular hot seller fell off. Well, we just got a shipment in from one of our small seasonal vendors, our SSV. And they shipped in some garments quickly because this item was moving very fast. And we brought this UPC in. And we put it in the store and all of a sudden this one particular location came to a screeching halt. Well, by retaining that serialized data and having visibility to that detail, we now know that that particular shipment to that store came from this SSV, this small seasonal vendor, and they responded as fast as they could and maybe something happened, but what that store got was not the same as what the other stores have from the central DC. So those are just uh, some of the things. Um, let's talk about a recall. Uh, if we just have UPC and quantity and we've got to do a recall, well, do I recall every UPC, every item with that number or every item within that group? Uh, I recall everything? Or do I have visibility to the serialized data? and the systems can now analyze my inventory and pick out those items that came from this location that are showing this anomaly to its attributes. And now I can select just those EPCs versus UPCs and go after where did they go? Well, if I did an outbound, an outbound validation, and I ran something through an RFID read zone on the outbound side, well, I know all of my customers that got some of those items. If I had a camshaft that shipped out to uh, uh, an engine builder and all of a sudden one of the lobes was in the wrong place, pushing a piston through a, uh, a cylinder, you know, some catastrophic event. Well, if I can catch that along, I can catch those all the way upstream and know all the ones that had that particular serial number uh, in that particular batch or in that particular lot, I can pull that back before it causes a catastrophic event at my customer's location. So this has a, a lot of ramifications on being able to retain all of this data, as much data as possible, including the time and the date, uh, the GPS, as well as the attributes and being able to have visibility to that at some point in time in the future when something happens and we're able to grab these metrics and, and look at them and, and filter out the key components and provide us some real-time visibility very quickly and enable us to make very quick decisions accurately. Um, Thank you. Turn it back to you, Sheldon. Thank you. Let's, let's talk about um, like an industrial use case. And here's a case where something is serialized on purpose. A uh, product begins returning. It's, got, it's failing. It's like structural failure. Something's going wrong with the product. But your census didn't say that there was anything wrong. You didn't have any alarm that went off based on a min or, or a max being violated on this on your manufacturing sensors. So what what's going on here? How to determine which products need to be recalled or which might fail in the future? And that's a key point. That's that's the other thing that machine learning can do 
In other words, yes, as Michael just described, it, you know, RFID uh, um, can help us pull the exact ones from the, you know, from the supply chain or, or something that's been produced. But how about what's happening and what caused it going forward? What, what, how can we keep an eye or how can the system predict where this might be happening? So let's take a look. Okay, what does the data say? Well, we know that the returned item was produced in July. We knew that it was very hot and it was very humid. What did the census report for that time period? And was it then that the product's integrity began to fail? All right, so the anomalies, they spiked here July 1, you see that's an anomaly. That's the kind of thing that's gonna be pulled out from the uh, sensor data. But the readings were well within the calibration value, the hysteresis, the hysteresis is um, where when you've got a value for, um, uh, you know, a, an ideal configuration value, you, in certain processes, you have to, you, we, we, we allow um, a variance above and below so that the, for example, at home on your thermostat, it doesn't, um, it, it can't, you, you don't want the compressor to respond every time the, the temperature goes up a half a degree because you, you, the, the motor, the compressor is going to be going on, off, off, on, on, off, off, on, back to back and forth. You, you burn out the system like that. And same thing with the heater. You don't want your, 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 your oil or gas heater, you know, igniting and, and then shutting off a second later. Okay. So the um, hysteresis gives you like a, 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 it's like a fudge factor that allows the min or max to, to, to fluctuate a little bit, not a lot, just enough so that the, the, the machines can operate steadily and they'll perform at their, at their highest um, uh, perform, you know, performance and uh, efficiency, for lack of a better term. So was this anomaly, was this structural uh, failing of this part due to high humidity as well as this particular counter or whatever it was measuring of this production machine, was there a combination of those two things? Because now you've got, you, because you have the sensor data, you can now have some idea of where to look, where, what was it that caused the product to fail that, that was shipped back to me and it was uh, manufactured on July 1st. That's a, a very powerful tool. And here's that hysteresis. Now the other thing is, is that when we're talking about the time and date slice, and that is even an analog signal, which is a waveform, can be converted into a series of digital steps. So that um, a time and date stamp of, any, of anything, let's say when this particular RFID tag was read, and I've got a sensor value, I can pull it at any point on the wave or the digital value that it represents. At and so you can get an exact value for pattern matching purposes, as well as whether it's within that the, the range of the uh, 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 of the configuration. So, what what we what what hopefully you 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 take home from this, and that is is that the more data, the more the system learns. It gets better the more pattern, the more um, anomalies it sees now. Not necessarily, you don't want it to have a more anomalies, but you want it to, to, to see what normal operating looks like. The, and the more the normal operating looks like, that strengthens the pattern of normal operating. RFID, as Michael said, RFID data is valuable long after the stuff has left your warehouse. You, you don't know when you will need it again. And that's a key point. We may not know today what of RFID data can tell us tomorrow or next month or even next year. And it, it used to be that this was a challenge for uh, companies really of all sizes. Oh, there's so many, so much data that's going to be generated by our RFID. And the people were thinking of internal storage and, and how what they would have to do their own networks, etc. But the truth is, is that the um, storage is, just gets cheaper. It doesn't get more expensive.
And if this is so valuable to your enterprise, just eat it and then refine it and then let it grow because it will only bring you further value as you, um, you know, as it refines itself and your organization gets to take more uh, insight out of both the RFID as well as all your other sensor data. So how do we get started? So it's just what we've been saying all along. Start gathering and saving all the data your systems can give you, whether it's RFID or whether it's your, um, you know, your, your, your electric utility is giving you, you know, uh, kilowatt hour readings and this is all good stuff. Start using it, start saving it. And for example, why not capture uh, like, for example, GPS data every time you read a text. If it's available, if you're outside, take it. This machine, the uh, Alien H450 handheld, it's built in. That can capture the GPS data uh, when you're doing a, an RFID inventory process. And now you save that, store it, and use it because it's another one of those sensors that will help. And you don't even know how it will help, but because your the data set grows, it, it may be a pattern that will be apparent to the system as the system learns in the future. So, if you want to learn more about uh, IoT and AI machine learning, two good sources. Um, IBM Watson has got a ton of stuff on the web, and you know uh, they also remember analytics falls into this. Um, uh, uh, you know, BI business information and analytics are uh, um, ways that you interpret the data that's collected from machine learning. So, if the, um, the IBM pages on BI and analytics, uh, and then the, particularly IBM Watson it's got some great stuff on it, and uh, the Google TensorFlow is their open source toolkit for machine learning. And uh, if you've used any of their tools, you know how powerful they can be. And I'd like to thank you for joining us. We're right on target in terms of time. And I'd like to open it up to some questions. Phil, what do we got piled up there? Sure, yeah, uh, good presentation, guys. We got, uh, yep, I'll, I'll shoot the first one at you. Pretty direct, pretty simple from Jane. Who is using this today? Okay, well, <laughs> in terms of, uh, uh, NDAs, we can't give you names, but I can uh, share uh, a company type. And that is, is that um, we know one of the world's largest software vendors, probably a software vendor that uh, many of you uh, are using uh, today. They, it's, it's in this, they, they are doing it now. They are capturing everything, throwing it into their data warehouse. Okay? And that and, and, and you know, they, they, they even say, we don't know what, we'll, what the insight we'll gain from it today. We're putting it in there to learn, to have the machine learn, and then we, it, we'll see what it comes back and starts telling us as, we, uh, as, as the data set grows. That's literally their instructions to us. Um, another one is um, there are retailers who are using these uh, techniques as well. Shelley, we also have the, uh, the the fellow in New York that's a very large uh, wine and uh, liquor distributor has uh, RFID tagged all of the wines that come into their location, and now they have visibility to FIFO, first in, first out. Uh, they have uh, inventory. They've got POS. They have loss prevention, uh, and they've been able to do all of this. In a, in a in a glass and liquid environment because the technology of the tags has also now evolved uh, actually another uh, example is the diamond wholesaler a major one of the world's largest diamond wholesalers and every day they do an inventory where they take the, the stones in and out of the the vault and the vault is the size of my bedroom and the, 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 the stones come in 
sleeves, which I'm putting, um, I mean, uh, yeah, sleeves inside uh, boxes, and there are hundreds of boxes on carts that get wheeled in and out of the state. Well, in the olden days, you would have to literally scan the barcode in every one of those sleeves to do a um, uh, inventory, which was basically impossible. And it wasn't done. It was done twice a year. But because of RFID, they're able to do an inventory at the you know start of the day, at the end of the day. Oh, what they were able to do is to associate, uh, is to do a mashup to do to do this. Um, I mean, more of a single purpose. But if there was a a stone or a sleeve, that's um, that's a a um, in other words, it's uh, an anomaly. <laughs> Because there's an exception, they put the uh, pull up the video and look at the time and date stamp and match the time and date stamp to the um, to when that stone was last seen, and they were able to associate when it uh, went out the door, and they could see who took it. Turned out it was the boss, but the boss, you know, often doesn't uh, run by the. Uh, um, follow the process, the processes in a family-owned company. And then the other thing that they were able to determine once they had an, an anomaly uh, where the counts did not match, and the, it turned out that one of the, the sleeves, the stones, had fallen into a trash can by one of the workers' desks, and um, it was they 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 got an alarm at night because the RFID system picked up a tag that was moving around in the office and it wasn't in the state. So there's additional data and additional benefit that came from the solution. Next question. Okay, this is from uh, from Fred. In your retail example, how do you know whether something is left in the dressing room? Okay, so that there's this there's you know a number of ways. No, way number one. And that is, is that over time, retailers have a really good handle of, you know, what percentage of their garments are sold for or they, when, when they go in and out of the dressing room. There's certain people that obviously take 25 things in, or they probably have limits, but it's not like to take five things in just to pick one. But for the most part, you, you get a feel for, um, you know, uh, the percentage of, 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 of clothing that's sold when, when, when it goes into the to the dressing room. That's number one. But number two is, is that you can either uh, make it a standard operating procedure to take a handheld and before you empty the the dressing room at night and, and put the goods back on the shelves, you you do a cycle count of that location. So that's that's a that's a, a straightforward way. And the other uh, way to do it is if you if if you're busy enough and your and, uh, enterprise supports it to have a fixed infrastructure that knows what's going into the dressing room and what comes out. Next question. Okay, we got, we have a handful more, but uh, since we're right up against the hour, I think this could be uh, the last one. It's a good, simple question from Marshall. Uh, what does this solution cost? Uh, well, uh, Marshall, as you know, you know what the answer is? It depends, yeah. depending on what you're intending to do. Um, how many, you know, how many stores? Uh, so many factors that come into that. Whether it's stores, whether it's a factory, whether you need rugged, whether you need IP65 rating, whether you, uh, depending on the data set and how much of the uh, computing uh, you'll be renting from um, either AWS or Google, uh, etc. So or IBM. Um, so it really depends, and we'd love to talk to you about it. We can be reached at sales@cyber.com. Uh, either uh, Mike or myself, we both monitor that account, and we look forward to hearing from you. And Marshall, please send regards to your wife. They'll be, I say, hey. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time. Everybody's got a busy day, and we'll let you get back to um, to the work that you that you have to do. Thank you so much, and uh, have a good day.